All right, so we're recording. Well, welcome everyone to the School of Architecture and Honors Presents Lecture by Cynthia Fishnam. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging and with honor and respect the indigenous nations on whose traditional territories the, the University of MSU now stands and whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. We also acknowledge the elders past and present, including MSU's current Council of Elders and humbly ask for their guidance. The Valley of the Flowers has been and remains a place of learning for Native American peoples who for millennia have passed ways of knowing, being, and doing from one generation to the next. While well, land acknowledgement is not enough, it's an important social justice and decolonialization practice that promotes indigenous visibility and is a reminder that we're on settled indigenous land. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Cynthia Fishman, who is certified with AIA, BSPEC, and CARB Lead AP. ACUE and is a Fitwell ambassador. She has an extensive background in 10 plus years of sustainability and the practice of architecture, having received her Bachelor of Architecture from Rice University and her Master's of Science in Biomimicry from the only elite accredited program in the world at Arizona State University. She brings vision and leadership to the Biomimicry Design Alliance, a firm she founded in 2018. Cynthia also teaches biomimicry as an adjunct professor uh, and faculty member at the University of Colorado Denver College of Architecture and Planning, as well as, well as at the ECOSA Institute of Prescott College. Ms. Fishman is one of the recipients of the 2019 AIA Young Architect Award and the 2018 Engineering News Record, Top Young Professionals Award, uh, in AIA Colorado's Leadership Award in 2015, and her firm recently received a National Science Foundation grant to continue their work in making biomimicry accessible to the design community. Um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Cynthia. Excellent. Thank you so much, Atticus, and thank you everyone for um, attending this lecture and having an interest in biomimicry. I'm sharing the correct screen. Okay. Atticus, is that you can see the screen and everything? We're good? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Cynthia Fishman, and um, I'm currently in Denver, Colorado. And um, as I said, I teach biomimicry um, and kind of just live, breathe, eat, sleep it <laughs> as well. Um, the firm that I founded in 2018 is called Biomimicry Design Alliance, which is definitely a mouthful. So um, we usually call it BDA, just so it's a little bit easier. And BDA's mission is to make biomimicry accessible to the design community. Um, even though it has been around for a while, um, it's just there are a lot of barriers to it being accepted, especially in the architecture profession. So what BDA focuses on primarily is working on consulting with either architects directly or with their clients. We do biomimetic product design. We do our own unique research. And then as um, education is wildly important. So that is why I teach and do lectures like this. Um, BDA is comprised of a handful of people who all have different backgrounds. Um, there are nine of us right now, and our um, where we come from in terms of our perspective can be both from science, so we have a biologist and an ecologist. We also have design in terms of um, engineers and architects and interior designers, people trained in biomimicry. Um, an astrophysicist, we just kind of have as many people as possible because one of the amazing things about biomimicry is that it's so collaborative and interdisciplinary. And by having all of these different disciplines at BDA, we get really great um, feedback and perspectives in terms of when we're working on something because everyone's coming at it from a different angle. BDA also um, is an actual alliance. So we've partnered with numerous uh, Denver institutions and businesses utilize their expertise. So if I have a question um, about a certain plant and want to understand the mechanism of how it's actually functioning, I can just call up the Denver Botanic Gardens and ask them because, you know, who would know more about plants? Um, and it works out really well. And I don't necessarily have to hire a horticulturist. I just have pretty much, you know, the entire science and design kind of community in Denver um, available for me to utilize them. So it's really great. So let's jump in. Uh, biomimicry it comes from the Greek bios, meaning life, and mimesis, meaning to imitate. And the official definition of it is the conscious emulation of nature's genius 
by mimicking forms, processes, and systems. And this term of biomimicry, and as I said earlier, we've been you know, doing biomimicry for a while now, but it really wasn't until 1997 when Janine Benyus literally wrote the book, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. And it was at this time that it gave it um, a title, a category, a heading. That way all the research and designs that are happening under biomimicry could then be grouped under that word. Um, before then, we, there were just lots of different words that were used um, in order to describe this type of design lens. An example of what biomimicry is, is shown in this photograph right here. So kind of an easier to digest definition of biomimicry is that we are mimicking nature's designs from a functional perspective. And functional is very, very important um, as we'll get to a little bit later. So with this image here, um, a scientist whose name is Dr. Frank Fish was looking at a model of a whale in a museum gift shop and was curious as to why its fins had those kinds of bumps on the leading edge. And he then researched and was able to find out that even though these animals grow up to 40 to 50 feet long, they weigh 80,000 pounds, they're able to glide effortlessly in the water and create minimal disturbance. And all of that is really due to these bumps on their fins. And these bumps are called tubercles. So he decided to start a new company called Whale Power that works on creating wind turbines and fan blades that mimic the functional form of a whale fin. And because of that, these new blades have an 8% improvement in lift and a 32% reduction in drag. So just by asking for nature's help, we can make our designs more efficient um, and most of the time more beautiful. The word biomimicry um, gets confused with a lot of other bio words. Um, so we're just gonna kind of go over a couple of those just to set the stage. The one that it probably gets confused with the most is biophilia. And what this is is that humans have this innate tendency to go towards living things in terms of really enjoying the outdoors and specifically with architecture, it's all about bringing the outdoors inside. So it's having lots of windows to look out there. It's also including green elements within the interior, having water features, natural light, using different patterns um, and just kind of organic components. So that's what biophilia is. So it's really this interaction with the interior and the exterior and not about a functional form in nature. The next one is biomutilization. And with this one, it's when humans harvest nature to utilize it for something that we, we have that resource for. So in this example, um, we would harvest a tree to make a wood floor or two by fours or pieces of paper. And I do just want to point out that with bio-utilization, once we harvest this organism, whether it be a tree or whatever it is, the organism is dead. And the reason why I bring that up is that on the other side of that coin is bio-assisted. And with this type of bio word, it's where we use nature as a catalyst to do something it wouldn't typically do. However, the organism is still alive. So we're just putting it in a different environment. So a really great example of this is utilizing yeast to make beer. Um, so the yeast is still alive and we're just putting it in a different environment that it wouldn't typically be in. The other word that definitely gets confused with biomimicry is the concept of biomorphism. And with this, it's really just about copying the form of nature. It has nothing to do with the function. So the example that I'm showing here is like what Frank Lloyd Wright, excuse me, Johnson Wax headquarters building in Racine, Wisconsin. And in this image and in this building, these columns are really famous and beautiful, and they're meant to look like trees. However, they don't function like trees. So that is why this is biomorphism. So now that we've started to set a foundation for what biomimicry is and what it isn't, I want to take a step back and discuss actually the title of what this presentation is, which is Unearthing Design Inspiration with Biomimicry. I want to dive a little bit deeper into what exactly is inspiration and where do we get it? In addition to defining what biomimicry uh, as a word means, I really do love my definition. So I looked up what the definition of inspiration is, and it's all about getting a new idea, but being excited about something, either emotionally or intellectually. 
and being usually having something to do with being creative. So architects typically look for design inspiration by looking at other buildings as examples. We do precedent research to see what worked, what didn't, what do we like, what do our clients or teachers prefer. And by doing this, it provides inspiration for our designs. And while the lessons learned and building upon the past are important, by looking at similar or the same inspirations time and time again, our architecture has the possibility of being stagnant. Um, where's the innovation? Where's the inspiration? How can it solve new issues if it's looking at old solutions? So a company um, that's called IDEO, and this company um, uses design, the design thinking approach to design products, services, environments, and digital experiences. And they do some absolutely amazing work. So I highly recommend checking them out. And according to them, one of the best ways to get inspired is to look outside your context. And that IDEO designers often use analogous inspiration to gain a fresh perspective. So for example, they, if they're working with a medical profession, they would recommend that the emergency room doctors can go get insights about how to organize their medical supply by spending time with a NASCAR pit crew just to get a totally different perspective. And that is really what biomimicry is all about, is getting a new perspective and having new sources of inspiration. So what if we were to look at nature to gain architectural inspiration as opposed to just looking at precedent buildings? So how do we look? nature um, in order to get inspiration because that, yeah that sounds really good theoretically but practically you know how how do you go about that and how biomimicry is set up is it utilizes something called the three essential elements and each of these elements are equally as important um even though majority of people know biomimicry by the emulate essential element which we'll get into a little bit later but ethos and reconnect are equally as important with reconnect um really kind of encompassing the concept of biophilia and just reconnecting with nature. And then ethos is more of a philosophical or ethical perspective of how humans fit into the big picture on this planet and what our role is and how we should, what kind of relationship should we have with the other organisms that are on this planet. So in terms of emulate though, um, which probably you know, is much more exciting, I guess, uh, to architecture students and definitely to me too, um, we would utilize the biomimicry methodology. And what this is, is it's broken up into four different phases, scoping, discovering, creating, and evaluating. And within each of these phases are other steps to help you learn from nature as an inspiration. And the reason why this isn't a list of step one, step two, step three, is because you can really jump into this biomimicry thinking methodology at any point. So there are really two main paths that are used. So the first one is called biology to design. And with this one, you start off in the discovering phase. And with this, you would be reconnecting with nature by going for a hike. You could be watching a nature documentary. You could be reading a book that just talks about some really awesome organisms. And they're so inspirational that you want to learn more about them. And then you get to discover all their superpowers and then figure out how to incorporate that into a design. And biomimicry doesn't just mean, isn't just used in architecture. It can also be used in engineering product design, medicine, transportation, and even social interactions. So getting back to biology to design, in terms of discovering um, an inspirational natural model, this is my favorite organism, and this is a mantis shrimp, and they really are this color. They're not from Mars. Um, they're kind of amazing. So they are about four to five inches long. They're at, they live at the bottom of the Indian and Pacific Ocean. And its front appendages um, when it's either um, attacking some prey or defending itself against a predator, these appendages can move 50 times faster than the blink of a human eye, which is just absolutely incredible. So material scientists are really looking into what kind of material are these appendages made out of that it could withstand that kind of movement. And because of these appendages moving so fast, it's a literal one-two punch with this mantis shrimp because it's physically punching whatever it's hitting, but then it moves so fast, it creates a sonic boom. 
um, which is just amazing. And also engineers are looking into the hinging mechanism of how these appendages can have so much potential energy that then transfers into the kinetic energy and then moves back and is able to repeat this process indefinitely. However, mantis shrimp are actually known for something else is that they have the best eyesight of any known organism on the planet. And with this eyesight, not only can they see visible light, even if though they're on the bottom of the ocean, so they don't even get the visible light spectrum down there, but they can also see infrared and ultraviolet. Each eye operates independently and its brain can process that amount of information. And then with humans having only three color receptor cones, a mantis shrimp has 16. So the world and reality that it lives in is completely different from the one that we see. So in addition to learning about its appendages in terms of a material scientist and an engineer, we can also learn a lot from its eyes of trying to create better lenses or lasers or really anything that's dealing with sight. And especially in the medical community where trying to be able to detect um, abnormal cell growth a little bit sooner. So what if there was an app on your phone or a lens and you could just scan your arm to see if you've been out in the sun for too long? Um, so there's really limitless possibilities in terms of what we can learn from the mantis shrimp. And with using the biology to design pathway, we first discover all these amazing superpowers, and then we'll find a place that they fit into the human design world. However, as architects, um, we would probably use the challenge to biology method um, a little bit more than a biology to design. And with this one, it starts off in the scoping phase and you would start off your project, you know, the same way that you start any other project of defining the context of, you know, where is this, you know, for example, if we're doing architecture, where is this building located? Um, what are the design constraints? What, what's, what's the weather? What's the topography? What's the program? What's the budget? All those kinds of things. And then move forward um, to start incorporating biomimicry. And the next phase with, or the next step, excuse me, within scoping is identifying the function. And this is hugely important to biomimicry and is really what makes it different from a traditional design process. Where typically we as designers, we ask the question, well, what do you want your design to be? And then, you know, the client or whoever answers this question. But with biomimicry, you reframe that question to, instead of saying what you want your design to be, you ask, what do you want your design to do? And just by switching that verb, you then open up all of nature in order to inspire you and help you solve your design challenge. So for example, if I ask you to design a light bulb, that's you know asking what you want your design to be. And then that is very confining. And also nature doesn't design light bulbs. However, if I really think about it, well, what do I want my design to do? Well, I really want it to illuminate. And by just changing and reframing that question, now all of a sudden there are lots of examples in nature of that illuminate. There are fireflies, dinoflagellates. Um, they've just discovered that like the platypus also can glow in the dark and a new shark can glow in the dark. Um, so nature really likes that whole illuminating thing. Um, so then to really dive into a good example of this is with a typical building, um, there are lots of components that we pretty much always use. Um, one of them being that we include, if it's a hot climate, um, air conditioning. So with this example, the client approached the architect whose name is Nick Pierce and was like, yeah, we're gonna create this office building. It'll be in Zimbabwe. You know, I'm looking to save money because that's kind of what all clients <laughs> wanna do. Um, how can you work with me with this? So the architect Nick Pierce, instead of just throwing in an air conditioner. He's like, well, what's the purpose of the air conditioner? What do I want my design to do? And really it's all about regulating temperature in a hot environment. So Pierce looked to termites for inspiration. And these termite mounds are six to 30 feet tall. Um, and last time I checked, they don't have air conditioning in it. However, this species of termite, it's actually a farmer and that it grows its food, which is a fungus within these mounds. However, this fungus needs to be kept at approximately 87 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take one or two degrees. And termites have evolved to learn how to manage and regulate the temperature within these mounds so that its food source can survive. 
And the way that Pierce approached it, we've actually done more research that he didn't exactly grasp the entirety of it, but based on what his understanding was, which is all about the thermal mass of the mound itself, the thermal mass of the ground that it's on, and also the intricate tunnel system that termites build. So that way it utilizes the chimney effect and that the heat, the hot air rises. Um, so utilizing those different perspectives of how to regulate temperature, he created the East Gate building um, in Zimbabwe. So this is a 330,000 square foot office building. And when it's passively cooled, it only uses 10% of the energy needed by a similarly conventionally cooled building, which is just kind of crazy. And then it, there, is an art, there is an air conditioner in it, but even when the air conditioner is on, it consumes 35% less energy to maintain the same temperature as a conventionally cooled building, just by looking to nature for inspiration on how to solve a design challenge. Probably most famous of all biomimicry examples is this one. So in terms of gaining inspiration from planet Earth, um, in 1941, a Swiss engineer was taking a walk with his dog. Um, this engineer, George Demestrau, noticed that his dog was covered with um, these seed pods from burdock seeds. And I don't know if any, I'm, you know, being in the front range of Montana and Colorado, it's kind of preaching of a choir, like we're all very outdoorsy. So um, because there's a lot of us, normally I would ask you to raise your hand, but I wouldn't be able to see everybody. But I'm assuming that, you know, we all go outside and we all have the experience of having some kind of um, seed thing attached to our, our pant legs or socks. So what Damon Strahl did, though, is that he was curious as to how they actually attached to his dog. He looked at it under a microscope and was able to figure out that it attaches temporarily. That's what the design is supposed to do. And by attaching temporarily, having these small hooks on the end, it can attach to soft surfaces. So if an animal with fur or hair walks by, these burdock seed pods are able to attach. And by doing that, it uses the least amount of energy to spread the seeds as far as possible. It doesn't even have to do anything. It just relies on other organisms to really do all the work for it. And so Damastral mimicked this functional form of having a hook on one end that can attach to a soft material on the other end. And that's where Velcro comes from. However, biomimicry can do so much more. It's not just about Velcro. Um, so this image right here is pretty weird looking and definitely kind of looks like it belongs in Mars. And maybe this is where the mantis shrimp is supposed to come from. Um, but these rock formations and colors have not been Photoshopped, the colored ones, not the black and white in the back. But what this area is, is the Danical Depression, which is in Ethiopia. And incidentally, this is where the famous Australopithecus fossil Lucy was found. So just to kind of put it in perspective, um, and that was in the 1970s. So this area is an extreme environment. I mean, it's not just like crazy neon colors. It's a highly, highly acidic with a pH of zero, extremely saline, and the temperatures range between 194 and 228 degrees Fahrenheit. It is, you know, extreme to the max. So you would think that there'd be nothing alive here. However, there are microorganisms that have learned to survive in this extreme environment, and they're called extremophiles. So we as designers are able to look to these extremophiles in order to gain inspiration on how to live in really extreme climates. And, you know, really what's the most extreme climate, I would say, is space. So the astrobiology department at NASA is actually going to all these extreme environments that maybe don't have sunlight, don't have oxygen, are really acidic, really cold, really dry, and learning about how life can survive there in order to make human space missions actually work better. Because... Who better to learn from and to gain inspiration than the organisms that are already surviving in these kinds of environments? And we just have to ask for their help and their inspiration to figure out from a functional perspective how they've solved those design challenges. 
So some of the projects that BDA has worked on in terms of gaining inspiration from more uh, terrestrial uh, <laughs> organisms as opposed to looking at these extremophiles is we were one of the um, winners or finalists in the Biomimicry Global Design Challenge in 2019. And with this challenge, the Biomimicry Institute gives you a very large, like a very broad concept and you're supposed to solve it using biomimicry. So that year, the challenge was pretty much to solve climate change, which is so easy. I mean, like, you know, really child's play. <laughs> what my team decided to focus on is the concept of sunny day flooding. Um, and what this is, is because the volume of water in the oceans is increasing, where our shorelines were current, like were located beforehand, no longer applies. So even though there's not a storm event, during high tide, the water moves further inland and floods the infrastructure, buildings, sidewalks, schools, houses. Um, and we were specifically looking at Florida due to its low elevation and also the ground makeup of the majority of Florida is limestone, which is extremely porous. So not only is water coming in from the sides, it's also coming up from below. So we really wanted to focus on how we could find inspiration to deal with this problem of sunny day flooding. So again, the big question, and if you know the only thing you take from this lecture is this sentence, then I'm definitely winning. So it's, what would you like your design to do? So we wanted our design to absorb or collect the majority of the water that was flooding these streets. And then once we had the water, we wanted to be able to direct it somewhere else. The, what is typically done is that sandbags are piled up to kind of you know, keep the water at bay, um, or different municipalities are installing really expensive pumps or raising streets. Um, however, we have a lot of our development along the coast of the United States. So there's really like no way to do these types of very expensive infrastructure improvements. And even though sandbags definitely do work, there's still all that water there. So directing it somewhere else was really important for us. The next step we wanted to take is to filter this water um, because in addition to it just flooding everywhere, it actually starts to um, mixed with the potable water. And then obviously it's not drinkable anymore. And then finally, we wanted to be able to store the water because if we just pumped it back into the ocean, it really wouldn't solve anything because the water would just come back. So we would need a place to store it until after the high tide. And these sunny day flooding events would, are currently happening approximately three, two to three times a month. So it really is an issue and sadly it's just gonna get worse. In terms of looking for inspiration, we actually found dozens and dozens of different organisms that could solve these challenges of what we wanted our design to do. We decided to, this is actually a narrow down list, of, we narrowed it down to six different organisms. And because I had stated that the directing of the water was really important, our inspiration for that was a lymph vessel. So with these Vessels, they have a passive way of allowing the fluid, lymph in this case, but what we would use is for it to direct water. And with these flaps, it only goes in one direction. So there's no backflow possibility. And that way we always know where the water's going. And you know, with the pressure of all the water that's gonna be collected, it will flow to where we want it to go. So this concept, um, we named it BLOTS uh, because it would be blotting up the water, but also because it stands for the Biomimetic Land Ocean Treatment System. And the idea is that there would be multiple layers of this product that would all do different functions. They would also include a spigot so that it would help filter the water, and then it would be stored in these containers that would utilize um, inspiration from the other organisms in terms of making sure that the containers um, not only store the water, but are also lightweight and stackable and um, don't get brittle when they're not in use since it's only two to three times a month at this point. So the next project I want to go through is one where we really took inspiration from the site. So this was a design competition for a treehouse that uh, would be built in the Breck, France. 
and it's just this beautiful piece of landscape with a ruined castle on it. I mean, you know, who doesn't have a ruined castle in their backyard? Um, so with this site, um, it's also, Vibrac is known for all of its rivers and it's very much um, a city that has a lot to do with water. And also over 200 days out of the year, it's overcast and raining and very high humidity. So we really wanted to utilize the inspiration from organisms that know how to deal with that type of humidity and that type of climate. However, in order for us to start, we really were taken aback by this photo of one of the ruins, and it was just really inspiring to us. Um, so with this lecture, it's not that you can't look to precedent other buildings and only look to nature. You should really look to everything for inspiration. So with this image, it really reminded us of a wax mask. And yes, this one is huge and really scary looking, and they're not typically like this, but the pattern and form of it just really reminded us of what that piece of ruined castle looked like. So we decided to look to wasps um, from both a biomimetic standpoint and also a biophilia standpoint. So with wasps, they can construct their nests anywhere and they're completely adaptable to its environment. So with our tree house, we wanted it to do the same thing where it was very tree specific of how the actual tree house was built. Also the fact that with wasps nests, they're hung from the top and there's, they're not supported from the bottom. We really like that idea in utilizing the tree branches to support our tree house. We also really like the hexagons because we were able to make a modular system. And also it could be, again, very tree specific in terms of how we organize those hexagons. From a biophilia standpoint, we were just really loved how a paper wasps nest depending on what type of pulp that the wasps are eating, it creates these beautiful stripes and the striated pattern is very biophilia and we really wanted to replicate that in our tree house. So with our design, um, it utilized the hexagons, it would be hanging from branches that could support the weight, um, so that way it was again very tree specific, and the plywood that's on the side we would utilize stains that were just left over and just painted in any kind of horizontal pattern in order re to recreate the look of a paper wasp's nest. It's also really important for our entire tree house to be mechanically fastened so that way it could be easily taken apart, stored, and used again. So this is an entire kit of parts where um, it again could be very tree specific in terms of how you organize those hexagons and then there were not only are there the stained plywood pieces, but also pieces of glass in order to really have this biophilia experience of being within the tree. This was just an example of one of the layouts of a tree and its elevation. In addition to looking to wasps to inspire us both from a biomimetic standpoint and a biophilia standpoint, as I said earlier, we really wanted to focus on what there was so much water and the humidity. So with our research, we found that the Hercules beetle, which is the one that has that like huge, almost like a rhinoceros tusk on the top of its head, that depending on the level of humidity, um, and typically in a dry condition, has kind of a kayak green exoskeleton or shell. But then when it becomes really humid, this shell actually turns black. So scientists were able to figure out the mechanism and strategy of how exactly this Hercules beetle's exoskeleton can just automatically change colors like this. And they were able to mimic that, again, from a functional perspective of looking at the process and created this humidity sensor that is a film. And then it's typically blue, and then when the humidity gets to a certain point, it changes to red and it can go back and forth. So we proposed that we would use this film on our stair risers in order to communicate to the people around the treehouse that it's about to rain. Um, and all this was inspired by a Hercules beetle. The next inspiration comes from, there we go, a pine cone. Um, and that in low humidity, the pine cone is in an open state. But then when it's high humidity, pine, clo pine cones close, excuse me. Um, and the reason why they do this is that they have multiple layers in each of those kind of scales. However, the layers are rotated 90 degrees. So that way they expand and contract rates. 
so a bunch of scientists were able to mimic what that form was of rotating this material and they created it's actually meant to be a solar shade that would automatically move based on the amount of humidity in the air we really liked this concept and instead of a solar shade we decided to make it into our roof so when the weather is beautiful outside the roof is open and you're just staring up at all of these you know tree branches however when it starts to rain the roof would automatically close and respond to its environment without you having to, the user having to do anything. So we, yeah, are, we were really excited about this design in terms of how many different biomim biomimicry aspects and then also these biophilia aspects that we were able to include. Um, this was really important for us for it to be tree specific and also not to hurt the tree um, by you know, connecting to it. Everything is just hung from these branches. And if the tree wasn't really meant to support that much weight, there is the option of supporting it from below. But in terms of a concept, this is what we were looking for. So as Atticus mentioned, um, we were extremely fortunate to have received a National Science Foundation grant last year for us to work on our own research. And what we're working on is a tool or a database, really a platform that would allow anyone to practice biomimicry, even if they don't have a biology background, and also even if they're not trained in biomimicry. And what this tool would look like, um, this was a mock-up of what the interface would look like, and we have since changed the name. So uh, it is now called Inspired, and that's spelled E-N-S-P-R-D, stands for Employing Nature's Solutions to Produce Responsible Designs. And the idea is that you would be able to put in your function of what exactly you want your design to do. You can also put in its location. So if you're looking to collect water and you want it to be in the desert, you'll get specific organisms that are champions at doing that. And not only will it just tell you what these organisms are, it will also dive into how exactly these organisms can do those functions. And then because this tool is specifically geared for the built environment, it will include conceptual renderings as well as performance metrics of how it would actually work. Um, so we're really excited about this project and pretty much half of the BDA uh, staff is working on this. And we're hoping to have um, testing and kind of the beta version sometime this fall. And then we're gonna be applying for uh, the next round of grants in the hopes of actually commercializing it. So keep your eyes open for this. My last example is kind of a different way of incorporating biomimicry and looking for inspiration. With this example, um, it was for the amenity building of a multifamily housing complex. And with this complex, it was roughly 250 units, and it included um, over 8,000 square feet of a clubhouse or amenity space. And in talking to the client of how she wanted us to utilize biomimicry, we've broken up biomimicry into really five major categories that we feel can be applied to all different typologies of architecture, so energy, water, social, material, and economic. So, you know, typically when you think of biomimicry, you're thinking more about the energy and water, maybe the material aspects. However, this client was really interested in how we could be inspired by nature from a social perspective. So the tool that we used for this is something called Life's Principles. And what these are, are 26 guidelines or, you know, kind of blueprints of how 99.9% .9 of the organisms on this planet function on this world and are able to thrive and survive. And they're not rules because um, there are those extremophiles who don't actually need sunlight or can, you know, live in extremely acidic environments and everything doesn't need to use, you know, life-friendly chemistry because, you know, humans and the majority of organisms really like water, where those extremophiles, maybe not so much. So we use these guidelines to try and figure out how we could create an amenity space that would deal with the social um, challenges that we saw with this clubhouse. And that typically with multifamily housing, your clubhouse is a place where there's lounges, that's where the gym is, that's, you know, there's a pool, the leasing agent, um, barbecue, that kind of stuff. 
Um, sometimes if, you know, the apartment complex is, you know, really innovative, they have like a dog wash or, you know, a place to store your skis or something like that. Um, however, we wanted to make an extremely site-specific amenity space. And specifically, we focused on the be locally attuned and responsive lights principles um, in order to make this amenity space really work for the site. What we did was we reprogrammed what the interior was. We looked at what types of programmatic functions the clubhouse currently was planned for, and then what could they really use? And looking back at that site plan from before, it's in this industrial park, and the idea is that young professionals would be working there, and now they would live there as well. However, these young professionals had no amenities. Like, yes, they have an amenity building with amenity, no amenities for the, their bigger picture life. So let's say they have small children. They need to drop them off at daycare. They'll have to drive 30 to 45 minutes to drop them off just to go back to work that's across the street from their house. So that's just not really efficient. And also there's no grocery stores. So how are they supposed to get you know, fresh produce? And looking at what the resources were within this building, because it had a leasing office, we were thinking that we could utilize the people that were working there to create cooperative relationships and utilize resources that are available. So in our redesign, we changed the main focus of this amenity space to be a community greenhouse and also a daycare center. So we again be utilizing the biophilia aspect or reconnect in terms of the essential elements by bringing the outdoors indoors. And with this community garden, it would be able to grow fresh, you know, fruits and vegetables and herbs and flowers. And imagine hanging out in this lounge space instead of just kind of the typical, you know, chairs and a fireplace and a rug and, you know, that kind of stuff. Like it, you would be in this garden. Um, and then we would use the leasing agents um, in, in addition to their role as helping prospective tenants find an apartment. Perhaps they have a background in horticulture or just a green thumb. So they would help manage in their downtime this community greenhouse. And then with the daycare center, they also would have an opportunity to garden. And there were lots of other aspects that we changed um, for this amenity building. And when we were working on this, um, it was a bunch of years ago, even before I started BDA. And um, since then, the concept is actually, you know, not so novel because the Amazon headquarter, those amazing skiers in Seattle, utilize the same principle of bringing in this amazing outdoor area to the inside, which would help with productivity and workflow. To end, um, I want to. Uh, say a quote by author Paul Smith in that you can find inspiration in everything. And if you can't, then you're not looking properly. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, I stop sharing. And I would love your question. So, yes, please. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's any specific uh, way that we're organizing it. So either you can um, include it in the chat or if you just want to like start talking or you can raise your hand using the reactions, um, however you feel comfortable. I have a question. Excellent. So you talked about the process and like the step-by-step -step processes of integrating um, biomimicry into built design, but is there a similar step-by-step -step process for integrating biophilia into design? Um, not exactly a step-by-step -step process. There are some amazing resources that you can use. Um, there's a company out of New York City called Terrapin Bright Green and they specialize in biophilia and they um, publish a lot of really great literature and books about biophilia and they have, and it's for free. Um, so if you go to their website and kind of, you know, dig around in there, it's, it's not too hard to find, but they have a specific book called the 14 patterns of biophilia. And in that it goes, it does give you step-by-step -step of how to actually incorporate 
bringing the outdoors indoors. So I would recommend that. So it's not exactly the same thing as the biomimicry thinking methodology, but it's a really helpful resource. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good question. Uh, Cynthia, it looks like we just got another question in the chat, which is, uh, what is your research process like when you are looking for inspirations for projects? And how do you make the decision of what to use and what to focus on? Uh, excellent question as well. Um, so with our research process, um, not to you know sound like a broken record, but we reframe the question um, and try and figure out what what the purpose is that we're trying to design. Um, we, are, as I said earlier, we do product design. So we actually have a patent pending acoustic lattice. And the function of that is to mitigate sound. So using that function, we start reading scientific journals and articles and utilize uh, university libraries. So I would you know, highly recommend that you utilize your own and just start searching by that function and then use the advanced settings to just look at the biology examples. So you know, that way we're able to tap into the research that other scientists are doing. And then we kind of gather all of the different organisms because it, nature doesn't have just one solution, there are tons of solutions. And then we decide which one really seems to be the better fit and then we move forward with it. Another really great resource that we use um, as kind of our first stop in terms of inspiration is a tool called asknature.org. And that is run by the Biomimicry Institute, which is in Montana. And in it, it has over 1,700 examples of organisms, and it's all organized by function. So it's really, really great place to start in terms of find, you know, knowing what you want your design to do and then finding the inspiration with it. The difference between Ask Nature and Inspire, the project that we're working on, is that um, Ask Nature is really just about general biomimicry and how it applies to really anything. And Inspired is specifically for the built environment and is location-based and then also has those conceptual renderings um, to inspire you. Like how many times can I say Inspired? Um, and then also the performance metrics. But we utilize Ask Nature a lot of times uh, to start our research. And then from the organisms that we gather from Ask Nature, we always look at their references and then really dive into the uh, primary um, research that they use to, to find that organism. Well, everyone's thinking, Cynthia, I have a question for you. Um, yeah, sure. do, do you think, uh, do you see like a biomimicry being more like usable, more applicable in terms of designing for like specific products, specific things, or designing on like the systems level? Um, I think that, you know, it's excellent question as well, um, that with biomimicry, it is, even though, you know, we've been looking to nature for such a long time, um, I mean, Leonardo da Vinci looked at nature, like, you know, even when we were transitioning out of, you know, being hunter gatherers or just being hunter gatherers, like looking at other organisms of like, oh, this is not a poisonous berry, um, that it is still a very new design lens. So in terms of designing a product or a, like just focusing on one function, it's a lot easier to digest and kind of implement. Um, where if you have if you're looking more at a process or a system a lot obviously a lot bigger um so there are a lot more moving parts so you it seems that it's the the form is an easier way to enter into the biomimicry realm um but you really want to get up to the processes and systems because that's where you would make the most impact i had a question sure um you mentioned earlier that about like the interdisciplinary, how you have a lot of different people in a lot of different focuses. I was wondering if you could give any specific examples of like what different disciplines contribute to your projects, like how a biologist would contribute versus how an engineer would contribute. Yeah, definitely. Um, so with the Inspired team, um, the ones who have a biology background, they can definitely help uh, decode or translate the scientific journals a lot better than even someone trained in biomimicry or as an architect. And I super nerd out on science and just read a ton of it anyway, but there are lots of times that I don't understand what it is, but someone who's trained in it, they kind of speak that language already. Um, 
within the team, Inspired team. So we have let's see, two, two people who are trained in biology um, and then two people who are trained in biomimicry and they work on the first aspects of creating kind of these entries and doing the research. And then once they distill it down um, into something called an abstracted design principle. So with that, it's completely translated. There's no science words in it. So a designer or an architect can completely understand it. Then that team works with the people who are trained in architecture or interior design, and they help do something called bio brainstorm. So that's the third phase of the biomimicry thinking methodology. So once everything is kind of taken out of the science realm and put into the design realm, then we bring in designers to help utilize that. Um, however, everyone gets the same kind of like foundation and background training as part of our onboarding process. So that way the interior designers and architects, even if they're not always doing the research and diving in to like find all these organisms, they understand where the rest of the team is coming from. And if they're interested, they can always jump onto that. But, you know, usually because of time, everyone kind of stays in their lane. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure. question that I put in the chat earlier, but I think it might have gotten a little bit lost. Um, my question is, have you found ways to incorporate biomimicry, not just in the products you create, but also in the workflow and social dynamics of your organization? Because I know in the book, there's a chapter about business and interpersonal connections, and I'm really curious about that. Yeah, um, definitely. So we have... Um, what was the name of the, the example? It was based on honeybees. And I think the concept is called swarm logic. And it's a way to organize a business where it's not a hierarchy, where it's like your boss telling you, like, these are the projects we're working on. It's a completely like democratic process where um, all the employees get to vote. Um, on which projects the the firm will be working on, and that is you know taken directly from how honeybees make their decisions. Um, sadly, the the firms aren't dancing like the bees because the bees do the waggle dance, which is super great. Um, and I kind of want that to be adopted by by humans, but you know one thing at a time. Um, so in terms of BDA, with a lot of the projects that um, we're working on, it's you know, if since I'm mostly in charge of doing business development, I'm trying to go out there and find projects and then I bring them in and we determine if we're going to work on them or not. Um, if this grant seems like it's a, a good fit for what we're doing and we're working on another design competition right now for a horse museum in Latvia, which is really great. And it was opened up to the you know entire firm and you know two people were like, yes, I'm really excited about this. So that's why we decided to go with it. So you know, we definitely utilize that kind of um, social aspect of biomimicry in BDA, but also, you know, even looking at uh, the Great Barrier Reef and how corals and just that whole ecosystem is so collaborative and everything has a, a role to play and, you know, it's all cooperating um, and everyone's different. That's kind of also using, you know, especially with the interdisciplinary uh, backgrounds of everybody. Um, let's see some resources for that. There is a book um, called Teaming by, um, goodness, first name is Tamsin, and I'm totally blanking on last name. But yeah, if you go to Amazon and you look up Teaming, um, it's a really great book that discusses how social insects deal with each other and then apply it to the business world. And then there's also um, a website um, of a woman who's in New Mexico, and she specifically focuses on social biomimicry. And I want to say it's like bio.sys, I believe. Um, so those can also give you some really good examples of how to utilize biomimicry from a social perspective. Hopefully that answered your question, Molly. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, sure. <laughs>
it looks like we have another question in the chat. Um, oh, unless someone wanted to go first. Okay. Uh, how does one get into the world of biomimicry, and is it usually just through applying different, applying through different organizations, um, or is it more universally, and, or or sorry, is it more university or lab centric? Is it more organizations versus like university labs? Gotcha. Um, so in order to the the route that I took is that I, you know, went through architecture school, became licensed, and then decided to get the master's of biomimicry from ASU. Um, because with it being so new, I mean, the architecture firm HOK has been doing biomimetic projects and research for quite some time. Um, however, it's not necessarily that there's a, a biomimicry direct role in most firms. Um, there are firms who realize that it is the next up and coming thing um, and they're interested in it, but not exactly sure how to incorporate it. So the route that I took was to get the, the credential really um, and the skills and knowledge of having this master's degree. Um, but ASU also does have a graduate certificate program, which is only 15 credits as opposed to the 30 credits. And then um, Biomimicry 3.8, which is a for-profit wing of the Biomimicry Institute, also in Montana, um, they do these amazing week-long workshops and with, you know, hopefully the pandemic getting under control, we can travel again. Um, and you would get to spend a week in, in nature learning about biomimicry and learning specifically about those organisms. Um, I actually did mine in Montana, which was awesome. Um, but they have them like in Costa Rica. Like I really wanted to do that once because that just sounds amazing. Um, so that way you can at least get kind of the basics and the foundation of biomimicry. And really it's kind of, you know, up to all of us to tell our employers or you know, universities that this is something we want to do because it's not typically one of the tools that's used in a sustainability studio. Um, biophilia is definitely making more headway in terms of becoming a design lens that's utilized more, um, especially with the living building challenge, um, which is a really amazing and very difficult um, metric to achieve when designing a building, but it has a biophilia aspect of it. So because if if clients want to get certified with the living building challenge then they have to incorporate biophilia so that you know definitely helps it but with biomimicry it's kind of like the wild west where everyone's just kind of doing their own thing so you know i mean getting the credentials and getting the education in it is you know always a great thing but you know it is very expensive there's also um, the Biomimicry Resource Handbook, which is actually the textbook that's used for ASU, and you can purchase that off of Amazon as well. Um, I don't work for Amazon, and I don't mean to keep pushing everyone to go to Amazon. <laughs> um, however, in this book, it you know goes into great detail of how to actually practice biomimicry. So, you know, when you guys graduate and you're out in firms, just you know tell tell your firms this is what I want to do if it is something of interest. Um, Yes, a very long ramble to answer your question. <laughs> All good. Okay, so a couple more questions. Um, oh, did someone have one? I feel like I keep jumping in and somebody turns their mic on. Okay, a couple more questions from people in the chat. Uh, one is BDA currently hiring interns, and two, uh, does biomimicry have the potential to be more sustainable and environmentally friendly than other design approaches? Gotcha. All right, so I'll go with the, the second question first. Um, I think it does. It's, you know, really with anything, um, it depends on how you use it. So yes, with biomimicry, it can really be the ultimate in terms of sustainability tools and metrics um, because, you know, you, in nature, there is no waste. There are, you know, like there, it's learning how to live harmoniously with your environment. Um, however, with biomimicry, like let's say you you know create the most amazing product or building or you know something, but you're using toxic chemicals and child labor. Like nature doesn't do things like that. So you really need to look at the entire life cycle of what you're doing and the manufacturing processes and you know the end end use of it. Um, and sadly, like at this point, our infrastructure um, isn't really designed to mimic nature on a 
a massive level. Um, there are examples of businesses who are trying to change that. There's a carpet tile. Um, they don't just do tiles, but that's what they're known for. A um, manufacturer called Interface. And they've been working with Janine Benyes for many, many years. And not only have they created products using biomimicry of their pattern, their carpet, but also the materials that they use to create the carpet, the glue that they use, um, all utilizing biomimicry. And now they're moving on to um, revamping their manufacturing process and how even their employees get to work and really looking at all the aspects so that it can function more how nature functions. Um, so, yeah, that was very, hopefully I, did I answer that? I feel like I kind of lost my train of thought on that one. Um, yeah, whoever wrote the question, did I, did I answer it? Yes? Okay. <laughs> um, and then the other one with BDA currently hiring, hiring interns, um, not super sure yet. We have a lot of grant applications out there. Like that's pretty much my entire life, especially for the past three months. Um, and in terms of me manifesting, we're going to get all of them and then we're going to be completely swamped. Um, so we might be hiring interns. Um, we currently have two right now. Um, so definitely reach out to me um, and, you know, let's let's keep in touch. So, yeah, some shameless plugs. Definitely go to our website of uh, biomimicrydesignalliance.org. Um, I will hopefully be getting the list of everyone who attended, so I'm going to automatically sign you up for my newsletter, and you can always just opt out. Um, and then we have a really, I mean, in my opinion, a really great Instagram presence um, and Facebook. It's the same kind of thing. Um, but we do pretty much like one post a day, whether it's some kind of nature quote or a weird and unusual species or something else that's going on in the biomimicry world or keeping up to date with what BDA is doing. Um, or right now we're trying to win a grant through um, the FedEx, I think it's called the FedEx Small Business Competition. And it's sadly a popularity contest. So you guys are so inclined. Um, you go check out our Instagram uh, feed and you'll see the, the FedEx link and you just have to type in your email address and say that you're not a robot. Um, I lie all the time because I am a robot. So I just click that up. Um, but yeah, hopefully with us getting that grant, um, we'll be able to do some really amazing things. So, all right, that's it for my shameless plug. Okay, Cynthia, um, the public would like to know, uh, what is your Instagram handle? <laughs> um, so it's uh, at biomimicry.design.alliance. And you'll be able to see it with the our logo of the leaf with the ant on it. And also, if you just go to our website, we have lots of ways to, to interact with all that stuff there, too. But yeah, shoot me an email if you're interested in working yeah. with us. And, uh, and Cynthia, if you're, if you're okay with that, I'm, can, um, I can share your email with people if they want to email me. Um, either, either email Jaya through the School of Architecture or email Honors Presents. Mm -hmm, definitely. And if you forget to do that, you can always just hit the contact us button on the website too. So there are lots of ways to get a hold of me. I'm everywhere. Something is omnipotent. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, unless there's any last questions, then I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>